At the September 2014 FM Walleyes meeting, our special guest was Greg Powers, Fisheries Chief of the North Dakota Game and Fish Department. Greg has almost 30 years' experience managing the ever-changing North Dakota fishing landscape. His topic is the State of the State's Fishing Update. Here to introduce Greg Powers is our president of FM Walleyes, Scotty Brewer. Next, I'm going to bring up, last and foremost, Mr. Tyler Weiser. Tyler has been working on our speaker program for this year. One of the reasons why we come to these meetings is to learn something from our speakers, and Tyler has been working very hard on this year's speaker schedule, and he's got a pretty good one lined up. Uh, first of all, he's going to tell you a little bit about tonight's presentation. Well, you guys have all been coming to our seminars for quite some time. Uh, tonight's kind of special because we've had the big names like Al Winder, those guys, you know, and you hear a lot about waters that you may not necessarily get to go fish. So tonight I thought it would be good to bring in Greg Powers. He's actually with North Dakota Game and Fish with the Fisheries Department. And just to kind of see some of the opportunities that are really close to home. Uh, more and more is getting uncovered every year. We see in Fargo as far as small, you know, smaller lakes with good perch fishing. Uh, you know, we got obviously Devil's Lake, uh, Sakakawea, the whole Missouri River system. So I just wanted to bring him in here to share kind of what North Dakota has to offer. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Greg Powers. Thank you, Tyler. Can you guys hear me okay? Like no. this? Use the mic. You like the mic better? All right. I'll struggle with the mic. Uh, before I get going here, it's going. It just takes I uh, want well, to mention some of you guys are talking about the conversion to metric, English to metric, American to metric. Uh, for whatever reason, fishery biologists, academic, when you, most of us went to school at the University of North Dakota. Uh, years ago, but to this day, your training is all metric, and it's a, a bit difficult for even our, some of our biologists to convert that to layman's terms in inches, th three, 14 inches, 356 millimeters, exactly. Uh, and then we do deal with grams, and we have to convert to pounds. Don't ask me why, but fishery biologists deal with metric. It's an odd, odd thing. We're, I guess we can relate with our Canadian neighbors. As Taylor said, my name is Greg Parr. I'm the fisheries chief in Bismarck. I've been in Bismarck for way too long. Uh, I've been fisheries chief for about like the last eight or nine years. Uh, before that, I spent most of my time in the field in the early years up at Riverdale, Garrison Dam, working on uh, the Missouri River system primarily and working with the core, against the core, I don't know, on water management issues and stuff of that nature. I'm going to give you guys an overview of the kind of where we're at today with the state of the state fishery in North Dakota. Uh, I probably have well, I have a number of slides I'm going to just blow through here pretty quick, okay? And it, like always, I want to keep it informal. Uh, maybe if you can hold off to the end and ask if you have some questions, you know, I'll be here as long as you have questions. Try to do some question and answer on on North Dakota's fishery. I would. I would hope that everybody, even though I realize you spend probably the better part of your time fishing Minnesota, uh, everybody has a North Dakota fishing license. That'd be just swell. <laughs> All right. Uh, and again, if if I was here, my predecessor, of actually my predecessor's predecessor, somebody had been here with the North Dakota Game and Fish Department talking to a, a group of walleye uh, enthusiasts that spend a lot of time in the Big Lakes of Minnesota. This job would have been a lot more difficult 20 years ago. In, the, in North Dakota, if, you're, if you get out to the prairies, get out west of town at all, you know it's changed dramatically. Well, you know, you got a thing called flooding. Um, it's just changed dramatically, the climate in North Dakota, since, since June 30th of 1993, something happened. In, and it's, in terms of fish management, in terms of our jobs, it's been a good thing. So I'm going to go through these slides here real quick again. The state of the North Dakota's fishery. Today we have uh, about 420, 25, or I think our total now is 425 fishing lakes in North Dakota. And just for a comparison, 
1988, which is 25 years roughly ago, we had 168 lakes. So we way more than doubled it. Now, of course, land of 10,000 lakes, or I think in Minnesota, they technically say there's 5,400 fishing lakes, something of that na nature, but far cry from that. But we have a lot of water on, it, on, the, on the prairie. And the trend here, as you can see, has been upward in both, we, we, most last two years, this is through two years ago, but uh, last year's license sales too were record setting. We, both years we had record number of resident and non-resident fish license sales. Anglers have kind of responded to all the opportunity out there. And in a nutshell, this is part of the reason why we've seen this big jump in fishing license sales. These are our fishing lakes, uh, the, the black dots up there. We've had tremendous incre uh, increase in fishing lakes. Down here, I tell you guys in the back can read this, but uh, we, you know, take away the Missouri River system. 25 years ago, we had less than 100,000 acres of fishing water in North Dakota. Today, we have about 350,000 acres of fishing water, plus another, it's about, we're almost about 800,000 acres of fishable water in North Dakota today with the Missouri River system. We have 250 more lakes, 250,000 more acres in 25 years. So that's quite a, an improvement. Also over that time, just in the recent few years, last 10 years, we have 20,000 more boats registered, 44,000 more anglers, and again, 120 more lakes, 120,000 more acres of water to fish. So North Dakota's have responded quite, quite rapidly. We still, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Alaska, and I believe Wyoming are the top, and then North Dakota, the top five states in the nation for per capita fishery. Why does that happen? A big reason for that, this is a snapshot, you guys know, Wishick, Ashley country, Logan, McIntosh counties. Uh, this is 1992, and these are our fishing waters, and these were carp that were in both these. Uh, and then, oops. And then this, this is just a few years ago, we've added to this tally, 2011, but these are all the fishing waters just in this two county area. And you can uh, repeat that through probably about 10, 12 counties through central North Dakota. Uh, again, here you kind of a time, time lapse type of thing, but this is very typical. This lake here, the guys who just, I don't know what the name of it, it's not on the, it's not on the books yet. It's just coming up, I think. Next year we'll probably turn it on, but it just gives you an example of uh, of where we at 1996. And this is actually the water rate here is higher than it was <clears throat> back in the 80s. But you can see the road coming off this farm to market road. There's a farmstead right here, and then also pay attention to this dugout right there. We go to 2009. There's a lot more water creeping up here and actually going north there. That that. Dugout's still fine, but the farm, that road's starting to get, it's starting to get a wet around there. And then here's 2012. The road's gone, that dugout. So I mean, just that, three years compared to that. And since 2012, 2014, uh, that shelter bell here is, I think there's all but three or four trees left that all went underwater. So it gives you an example, and you know, repeat that hundred plus times in just the last few years out, out there. So, and what's happened is these shallow sloughs, these duck sloughs, <coughs> that may have been 100 acres, you know, and may have been three feet deep, are now, well, Dry Lake and down by Ashley, again, that's our poster child of a new district lake. That thing once in 92 was, or excuse me, yeah, 1992 was a deer metal. They hate it. There's a little bit of wet area in there. Uh, we really didn't have any water, standing water at all. Today, it's 5,000, excuse me, it's 3,800 acres and it's 30 feet deep. So, and that's just, again, one of many of those out there. And what's different, you get north and south Dakota, you get out in the prairie, or even western Minnesota, what's different on the prairie versus, you know, as you go up, especially you go up towards Lake the Woods or somewhere, is the fertility of the soils and the, and the water itself, highly productive. So these are fish factories. The biggest issue, historically, always has been, is to get fish to overwinter. I mean, inevitably, fish will, they can spawn. Let's say you got adults in there, they're going to spawn, they're going to grow. 
phenomenal growth, and then the winter kill. Well, now once again, about four, we need about 14 feet minimum for a maximum depth. If we get about that minimum maximum depth, then the fish will overwinter, and then they, you know, continue the cycle for a few years, and you get these quality fisheries. They can grow. Historically, prior when I started working, our our standard length for a walleye that was 14 inches, it took three full growing seasons. That's in our reservoirs and the lakes that have been around forever. These new lakes, some of them were getting 12 inches in the first summer, and a lot of them at 10 inch walleye in the first summer. And the standard used to be on the first year walleye are six inches. So it's really quite remarkable how fast they'll grow. What do North Dakotans like in fishing? We do these angler questionnaires, preference surveys periodically over time. Uh, you can see here's the big three walleye, per, pike, and perch. You've really seen the evolution of the North Dakota angler, and it falls in line with uh, we go back in the 70s and the linder days and the in fishing and just the whole walleye mania out there. You can see, and then all the new walleye fishers that did develop, the new ones, you know, the Sakakwias or the Columbia River, you know, John Day Reservoirs and stuff. Like that. At one time, pike and walleye were side by side for most popular fish in the state. <coughs> Not the case anymore. It's 10 to 1. People are choosing walleye over pike. Uh, this is open water fishing. In the winter, is a, a little bit shift. There's a little more pike interest and a lot more perch interest. But the trend is definitely walleye. North Dakota's like North Dakota's like these three, and uh, these other ones are just we call them niche fisheries because it's, no matter what we do, we have some really quality bass fisheries and uh, catfish, especially in upper end of Sakakwe and upper end of uh, Hawaii. Phenomenal cat fisheries, but there's just so little interest in North, in North Dakotans in that now. What we're seeing already is our, all our new brothers from down south are moving up in the Williston area. They like the catfish. So there's starting to be some interest in that one. And there's a lot of them out there to be had. With all that new water and some changes, we've, we've changed our management. We've learned a lot as we've gone along over the years, what does and does not work. And thankfully, we have, uh, we don't have a state hatchery in North Dakota. This last year, Hawaii got a state hatchery. Hawaii was the last state next to us not to have a state hatchery. So now North Dakota is the only state in the Union without a state hatchery. Thankfully, we have two federal hatcheries, Valley City and Garrison. And especially Garrison can really produce fish. The number one hatchery in the world, I shouldn't say world, but certainly in North America. Uh, <clears throat> but this is what we're stocking now. The number of lakes and the number of fingerling walleye, fingerling about this well, uh, walleye, you know, we're pushing, we're pushing five million walleye are being stocked, and this is, does not include our big waters, this is just these small waters. There are eight largest water bodies that are not included in this. <coughs> so thankfully, with all this, we've got the habitat out there, we've had the opportunity to get these things stocked. In terms of North Dakota's fisheries, and this really hasn't changed a lot over, over 20, 30 years, is uh, the big three, we call it right here. Sakakawi and Oahe was a river devil's lake. I suspect all of you guys have fished probably all three of them, probably routinely. Those three water bodies typically account for half of the fishing effort in North Dakota. And the other half is on all these little small lakes. So these are the big three that are there, they've been around you know, for 30 plus, 40, 50 years. Quickly, I'm going to go through these. Uh, thank you. Devil's Lake, and I expect all, all of you guys get up to Devil's Lake, get a kick out of this one. There's uh, no parking. And people, that's one of the North Dakota problems. We don't read signs very well. Here's another one. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's James song, actually. Yeah. Probably James song. Uh, Anyways, Devil's Lake, you guys know all that, how the, the whole story, what happened, you know, beginning in 93, how much water's come up, what a tremendous fishery that has become, uh, pike perch. The neat thing about the reason, Devil, two things, Devil's Lake is what Devil's Lake is. One is there's no rough fish in there to speak of. There's, there actually are some bullheads and suckers, but it is almost all the fish biomass is a desirable species. Uh, 
So it was formed white bass, yellow perch, northern pike, and walleye. Almost the entire biomass of fish production is in those. It's not tied up in the pond. There's no rupture. So that's going to be And also the, the backbone of that fishery is one of the most glamorous freshwater shrimp. That has tremendous population of that. Concern of ours here started about two years ago and has certainly increased this summer because we're seeing that dramatic drop in the shrimp in that lake. We don't know if it's all the predators out in the lake or if it's just, you know, it reached its peak a couple years ago, the lake. There's no more flooding of new vegetation trees. They really thrived back in those days. It started to stabilize. And uh, if you lose, well, you're not going to lose it, but you're going to, we're already starting to see slower growth without that shrimp in that lake. Or to the numbers they were, you're going to see a slowdown in growth. Uh, that's a bit of a concern, but beyond that, uh, the, we're doing reproduction sampling up there. It's still a walleye factory. God, we haven't stocked, I shouldn't say that, we've stocked a few walleye, but that lake is almost all self sustaining now. We don't stock, a couple years we stocked a couple hundred thousand on the east side of the lake, though. Salinity is much higher, so there isn't any natural reproduction because you get towards Stump Lake. But other than that, the West Basin is just a fish factory down in Channel A and uh, Mave Cooley, you know, Minnewaukee area. It's tremendous reproduction. It looks like it's going to be another good year class of walleye. We don't know if that's good or bad, though. Uh, perch, are, perch did okay. It looks like nothing like last year. Last year was a better year class of yellow perch, and pike are always good. Sakai uh, it's our largest, it's a reservoir obviously, it's completed in 53, it's our largest lake, 300, it's full, it pushes 370,000 acres as it was in 2011. There's more miles of shoreline there than there is on the California coast along the uh, it, it, it's, it's wonderful years of walleye and salmon fishing were in the 80s. Smell were introduced in the early 70s. Rainbow smell, cold water fish species, is the backbone of that fishery. The lake lives and dies of the smell population. Uh, they, they peaked out in their mid 80s, and the, the, all the predator fish just, if you guys, I don't know, if any of you guys got out there in the mid, mid to late 80s, it was phenomenal walleye fishing, big walleye. Uh, walleye, or the smell population crash just now. The problem with Sakakwea and Lake Waihi is that they're reservoirs, major reservoirs, and the water fluctuations are dramatic. You know, it's flood or drought, it seems like, and it's very difficult to, because you can't manage the water very well, it's hard to manage the fisheries. So one year it's way up here, next year it's down, and uh, the smell have just had a tough time. Uh, finally now, I'd say 2014, from what we're seeing, the smell numbers are probably ever been as good as we've seen in maybe 20 plus years out there. The downside short term of that is fishing has been okay, but not, it's not been anything. The walleye population, if it's not at a record population, it's near it. But you can kind of tell from fishing because of so much smell. Fish are so fat. Uh, salmon fishing has been slow, but, but we're catching, I mean, they're, what they do catch are 16, 17 pound salmon out there from like five pound years a few years ago. So the, the, I'd say the next three, four years, there's nothing but good to say about Sakakawea's fishery, but it's really in great shape. And it is the number one, I think 33 out of 35 years, it is the number one fishery in, in the state. You guys probably been in this chaos called Van Gogh in, in uh, June. On a weekday in June, you'll see the ramp sites looking like that. This is down, down the lower end of the lake. And then Oahe, Missouri River, I know there's a lot of Fargo Warrior people traditionally have come out there in April, the ice goes off, and some years it can be pretty spectacular. Oahe and the Missouri River below Garrison Dam really got hit bad, hard by the flood of 2011. Still recovering, I wish I, I, wish I had a crystal ball and say things would be all good next year. Uh, I think the worst years are behind us, but I don't know how fast it's going to recover. We've got smell issues still. The smell numbers in Oahe are nothing like they are in Sakakwea. And also the river reach, if you ever fish, you know, from Bismarck up to the dam, phenomenal fishing up till the flood. 
And then what happened with the flood is it just absolutely, basically channelized our river. And the saying there's for every, for every two miles there'd be 10 good places of substrate or habitat, big structure out there to fish, to hold fish, now there's one. It just blew all the sands up way high and dry on those points or to all of the floodplain. Uh, it's going to take a while for the river to reclaim some of that sand. Uh, we'll see. It's, I, I'm more concerned about that than anything else out there because these fisheries are so dynamic and they can turn around so fast. But when your habitat's kind of ruined, it might take a while. Beaver Bay, and it probably, well, it actually, something that's kind of cool we found out working with South Dakota Game Fish and Parks. Beaver Bay, this little, lots of, Biggest embayment in North Dakota on Hawaii. Here's Beaver Bay, west of, west of Linton, and then Cannonball River just upstream. Those two areas represent, we don't stock. Here's another fishery. We don't stock Oahe Reserve. It's all self sustaining for 30 years. Um, but they provide something like 25% of the, in all the walleye in the system down between Oahe Dam and Garrison Dam come from these two bays. So it's pretty, pretty. Uh, it's tentative data, we're just finding some stuff out, but they're very, very important spawning, spawning areas and gets a lot of use, especially in June, May and June. And then the river itself, again, if you guys have been out there, you have Bismarck area, it doesn't matter where, in the spring, the early bite, ice, you know, shortly after ice out, if you don't have a lot of tributary info, if you do, the river gets muddy and it just shuts things down, but if it's not a lot of tributary inflow, it's clear, it's usually very good uh, from, from Bismarck up to the dam. Tail race is a very popular spot, obviously, in many years. And then the summer comes along and those bolt, fishing boats are replaced with these. The importance of fishing in North Dakota, it's, it's actually fairly significant money. And, and one thing that people, I mean, you know, we're known for as a hunting state, a hunting destination, pheasants and deer, pheasants and deer. That's all you hear about. It's that people are passionate about pheasants and deer. But in reality, more money is generated from fishing than there does from hunting. There's more money spent fishing in North Dakota than there is hunting. I guess it is almost twofold. That's, and that's a study that Indi NDSU, their ag econ people do this about every five to ten years, do an independent study on the impacts of hunting and fishing in North Dakota. A gross, gross business volume, almost a billion dollars in, in fishing in the state. Uh, something I want to mention too is our, you know, our fishing license, this was the first year, really about 20 years that they went up in cost. Even today with the increased $16 resident license, we're still at lowest by quite a bit of all the surrounding states. And then down here, $16 license, and the average angler spends $3,000 fishing. So the license cost is a significant part of fishing. Why the good fishing that we're experiencing? I, again, I go back to that wet, the wet since 93, you know, the 93, 94, 97, 2000, 2009, 2011. I mean, there are so many wet years in there that created all this runoff to form these lakes. Another thing that were a big issue for us 30 years ago is bait bucket transfer. It's before the word A&S or AIS was out there. Our issue in North Dakota was uh, all the armchair biologists would take fish man management upon themselves. And we had pretty lax uh, bait regulations. So a lot of bait, either on purpose or unintentionally, were stocked into lakes and then bullheads would come with it or carp. And then we, we spent Oh, so much of our budget just killing lakes off. Uh, boy, I'd say in the last 20 years, that issue, it hasn't gone away, but it is. It's just not an issue like it once was. And the other thing, too, is unlike Minnesota and many other states, we still are pretty a and free. We don't have, we're still zebra muscle free, technically. Uh, somewhat hard to believe, but it seems like every other day there's a new lake in Minnesota that they're finding. And, and we know it's probably a matter of time, but we've got rules and regulations. You guys fish North Dakota, you know the line well rule that went in place in 2010. But, you know, collectively all that stuff I think is helping slow down and hope, uh, preferably eliminate the threat of A&S getting moved. Where this year we found 
one lake, one new lake. Last year it was one lake. So two years so far, we've had only two water bodies, and they both were plants. You know, curly leaf pondweed, your Eurasian water milfoil, not that big of a deal. So we are so fortunate so far in North Dakota when it comes to those problems. Uh, day to day management decisions, I tell you guys, we got biologists. We don't have many of them at all. But the guys we got are just top notch, and they've, they've gone outside of the book on a lot of things because we're still learning as we go along because it's, the textbook doesn't teach some of the stuff that they're doing with some of the lake management. They've made a lot of good decisions. Um, this hatchery production is critical. Without the hatcheries, we would be so in trouble. And every day it's more and more of a challenge because the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service hatcheries, federal priorities, mandates uh, are changing rapidly. And it's certainly gone away from recreational fisheries and gone towards endangered species. So it's been a real challenge to work. The, the North Dakota guys are great, but Denver and Washington, D.C., it's, it's We've been, we've been very loud about our issues with the way they prioritize stuff. You know, slowly we're, we're spending, the state's spending more and more on the hatcheries, and I think that's been a sign of the times that maybe someday we'll have to take them over. But right now, it's a heck of a deal for you guys. And then providing that adequate access, getting boat ramps or working with landowners. North Dakota, you guys know this, it's 94% private land. And the roads and oftentimes around these lakes, it's private, it's not public. And uh, it's so refreshing to work with landowners when it comes to fishing lakes. That's one thing that they're, I, I say that we've had so few issues so far with, with, with it, because they like to fish too, and their neighbors like to fish down the road, you know. So the landowner uh, angler issues, there just haven't been any in North Dakota. That's, that's a neat part of my job, because other places it's not that way. Uh, biggest threats in the next 10 years, water, always. If you're North Dakota, South Dakota, you know, it's always going to be water. I don't know if you can have too much. Yeah, you can have too much in terms of fish. I know, I'm not talking about flooding. But even in fish, you can have too much water. But having too little is really, <laughs> it's not good. Uh, next 10, you know, 10 years from now, who knows where we're going to be with the weather cycle. Uh, hatchery funding issues. A and S, we don't know what it is, but we could have some real issues 10 years from now. And then the other thing is those birds, those big black birds out there called cormorants. They have really wiped us out in some of our, our small fishing lakes. It's just, it's, it's a real bugger because you know, it's just recreational opportunity lost when they're eating a pound a day of fish. So, uh, quickly, just who are we, David Fish? We're very small. We're the smallest fishery to buy out. I should say that. I think New Hampshire and Hawaii are smaller than us. But we're right at near the bottom for, for number of employees, David Fish, or fisheries. Uh, we have, we're broken out into four groups, management, development, habitat, and production. The management, no different than Minnesota, where else the guys that do the netting, different types of netting, trawling, do the research, electrofishing. We spend a lot of time electrofishing. This is kind of neat. This is upper end of Sakaka. We have paddle fish in the year. We go out and catch them and then we tag them. And 30 years later, they show up. <laughs> and aging fish do a lot of that. You know, the same old normal management stuff. You know, it's going to take forever. Apparently, that's a 12 year old fish. Uh, development boat ramps and boat docks. We do not do Cadillacs in North Dakota. We're not a Cadillac state. Uh, I don't think you need to have Cadillacs, especially when the water, water levels fluctuate so dramatically. But, but I think we have first class amenities in many levels. And production, and again, I want to say this one more time. On, on the hatchery end of things, the state is responsible for taking all the eggs, in this case, pike eggs, you know, we get the eggs and we take them to the hatcheries. They go to the hatcheries, they raise them. They're there maybe five to seven weeks. They raise the walleye, the pike, the trout, the salmon, and then we're the ones that stock them, or the traffic transport of perch into these new perch lakes. 
group. So it's kind of a neat partnership, state-federal partnership that's worked well for 40 years until the feds are starting to pull things. Uh, every agency has a mission statement, has planning. And one of the things that we have in fisheries is we're into diverse fishing opportunities. And again, I showed that, that graph that basically 97% of you guys want walleye, pike, and or perch. But there's other fish out there. And we, you know, we still do dabble in other species. We have quality opportunities. The paddle fishery, this is, uh, the only one we got is above Sakakwea. We don't have anything, although there's a paddle fish population above Bismarck, below Garrison Dam. The only one that we have a recreational fisheries above uh, Sakakwea, Yellowstone River. We don't have much muskies. We're, we, we literally have, I think, five musky lakes in the state. Not, we're way behind Minnesota. Salmon. Lake, lake trout in the Missouri River system. Well, that's a state record for all trout. Catfish right here in the red, especially up towards Drayton. And pike. I'm going to leave with pike here. You guys, we talk about fishing opportunity. I know we all like, per I'm one of them too, perch and walleye, but I plug pike as much. I mean, that, there's no, no one person that could speak so highly of pike opportunity as you have in North Dakota. Quality pike, our limit is five, the most, probably the most liberal, the lower 48. We, we just increased from three to five. And there are lakes you can catch six to 12 pound pike in five a day. And, and a lot of those lakes are never going to see a worm. I mean, people fly to northern Canada to catch 10 pound pike, and we got them in our own backyard because, again, you only have so much time, so you're going after the perch bite or the walleye bite. But, Pike are, are so much easier to catch too. They cooperate more often. So we do have a lot of op pike opportunities out there. Uh, don't overlook them. At least they're fun to catch if you don't want to eat them. Our website has a lot of information. Game and Fish website, go to the Fisheries tab. Uh, there's a lot of information on there uh, about a, different, a lot of different things. One of your fishing lakes, where to go to. There's a place, there's maps. You can, Home in on the map, get closer, and we'll play. It doesn't matter. We got contour maps, contour maps in most of our lakes now, the better part of them, I think. And then we also have this section of any question you may ask, or if you have questions that we should post there, we'll put them on there, question and answer type things. So we've got quite a few of them that will answer the questions you might have. We do push, I think that's it, we do push for simple fishing regulations in North Dakota. We're a bit unique that way. The reasons, a lot of reasons, but one reason is we, one of our models is, is keep it simple, stupid. Uh, we don't, historically, we do not have the fishing pressure other states have. So that makes it easier for us to manage the lake. We don't have, you know, hundreds of thousands of million people coming to all the cities to fish in your backyard yet. Uh, so it's, it's easier that way, and our lakes are so productive that they can, in an acre of water out there, they can put out a lot more fish flesh in an acre, let's say, up in, a, in a, uh, north of Duluth or something like that. So we don't have a lot of regulations. Plus, we like fishermen. We don't want, one of the biggest hindrances to fishermen nationwide right now are regulations. They, they, they're confused. They, they look at a book and they're like, can what can I or can't I do? And you guys as a group, I would say for sure, you're, you're the exception. You're not the rule out there. You're the avid fisherman. You're not the normal fisherman. Most people out there are, go out a couple days a year. They, they do it totally for relaxation. They don't want to be found that they're doing something wrong right away. So we try to keep our exceptions on our lakes to a minimum. Uh, I don't know if we're going to be able to do that forever, but that's, that's one of our goals is to do that. Our regulations you can find on our website. But one thing, a little plug I want to make for regulations. Unlike hunting in North Dakota, fishing is governed by the governor's proclamation, which means us as biologists and field staff are making the decisions with advisory board meetings, with input from the public. We don't have laws in place, and it's really wonderful. When it comes to hunt, everything you do, hunt is mandated by a law. The law is law that fishing isn't that way in North Dakota. And it's wonderful. Uh, it gives so much more flexibility. And I want to push 
so a couple of you guys I know have been to the meetings, but Sport Fishing Congress, which is just an umbrella group of fishing clubs like this one, I believe. No, yeah, FM, all I belong to the Sport Fishing Congress. But they just represent all fishing clubs, especially in Bismarck, every other year when it's a legislative year for uh, potential legislation, good, bad, or otherwise. <coughs> because of them, I think over the years, they've been able to uh, basically enlighten maybe some legislators out there that, hey, don't enter, this doesn't, we can deal with this a different way. We don't need a lot to deal with this. And over the years, they've been very, very effective for minimal effort. The only problem with, and that Paul is one of the members of Sport Fishing Congress for his entire life, I think. And, and unfortunately, Paul, no knock to you, but that's the average age of Sport Fishing Congress is Paul. They need help. They need young blood. I see some young blood in here. So please, you know, jump in. It's, it, it's, believe me, they're nothing. They're not a political branch. Of, they're just good old boys. But, uh, they could use help, they could use some youth, they could use some new blood. So. Okay? All right, I can answer any questions you might have. Yep. Hey, when you talk about Devil's Lake and how uh, this year's going to be possibly a really good year class, that might be a bad thing. When we were there back in June, we had heard that there's a huge amount of 14 to 16 inch fish that your class was exceptional and they want to get rid of as many as they can because they're afraid of that, that your class is if, if it can, continues to get bigger, those fish get bigger, they may damage the population of the lake because there's so many of that here. Right. It, it's, you, it's unique but that's a problem actually in, in the Dakotas. <coughs> um, if, you fish, if, if you fish down in Hawaii right now, you've seen those fish are catching, those 14 inch walleye, 13 inch walleye are catching, are 2009 year class, they're five years old. They should be 20 inches. And because there's no forage. We have that problem a lot with our small lakes that people don't, you know, they think maybe five fish a day is too much or we should have a 14 inch on there. Sometimes that might be the case, but more often than not, our predator or our prey base in North Dakota is very simple it's perch and or fathead minnows and then invertebrates, leeches, or gammers, whatever might be in there. That's it, we don't have all the other species that buffer Minnesota lakes, of intermediate forage. And the, those, the perch population, fathead populations, they crash and they can, some, you, you cannot believe how many fathead minnows can be in a lake one year. You stock walleye and two years later they're gone. I just was, I just saw with the guys on the lake yesterday, and it's amazing. The walleye fishery is phenomenal. And it's going to be a phenomenal bite because they just ate themselves all pulse and all there's nothing out there. What we want now is anglers to harvest those fish. We don't, you don't want to keep them for another day so they get bigger because they're not getting any bigger. They're, they're done growing you know, until you can get that, that balance back. We see that a lot. And even, you're exactly right, Devil's Lake, we've got some concerns about Devil's Lake. Thankfully, we do have last year's perch year class, which is also, you know, we all want those 14 inch perch, but they're also, before they get 14 inches, they're they're bait, and those pike and walleye and everything they like those, and they'll they'll be good for a year or two, but they'll, you know we're going to lose those. And the backbone of that fisher again is those gammers and scuds. So the worst thing you could possibly have done, and we haven't done it, has been stocking. That was like that's not a good. Thing. We don't need to do that in fish factory right now. Yes. Is there anything that can be done with the cormorants, like at Leech Lake? Or yeah. am I just uh, talking to the wind like the president? Well, that's where the problem lies. <laughs> uh, I, I don't want to get into bureaucracy, but unfortunately, Minnesota, Iowa, points east fall under a, a, they had an environmental impact statement that allowed the state to do extra tools, to do stuff like they've done at Leech, Leech Lake, where they actually oil eggs, they can they harvest more. We don't have that ability. They're, they're a migratory bird. Fish and Wildlife Service are responsible for them. They will not allow us to do anything more. They do give us a special a depredation permit and we can harvest up to 1,200 birds a year statewide. Statewide. So, the guy, so, so what the guys do is, what we try to do in some lakes where the real problems, well like those damn, those birds they follow our, 
When we stock trawl, they follow the trucks. They just know. You know, you stock the trawl, which is expensive food. But uh, lakes that we have that we're, we're stocking trawl or something like that, we will uh, shoot them there uh, for a couple days and haze them. We will have guys on boats and just move them around. And we've had limited success, but you can only get that half a dozen, a dozen lakes out of 400 and some. I mean, in the big picture, big picture, even if we had the ability to do what Minnesota could do, that'd be a feel-good thing, too. The, the issue with cormorants, and we, it's just so out of whack. The population is so out of whack. They've benefited from all the, you know, Canada. There's, they don't know what the population of cormorants are in North America. And they don't want to know because then once you know, then you can establish a population of jetways. So, I wish I could give good news about cormorants that there's some, some silver bullet answer out there. You know, you can knock down trees and they make you feel good. But I mean, if you've been out in North Dakota, you see there. And what we've, the worst part is what we've seen now is that they're starting colonizing on islands, uh, off of the trees and on islands. And there's plenty of islands out in these big lakes and sloughs. And there'll be a thousand of them out. And, and, and there won't be a perch in 10 mile radius around those things either. Drive those stock trucks across the border into Minnesota and then shoot them all and then drive them. I don't think there's enough lead in so. Yes? When you're stocking, I'm just curious, what, what percentage of the stock actually makes it to a catchable fish? You know, it, it, you know nation, North, throughout North America, there's been so many studies, and, and the variability is so extreme when it comes to stocking. Cow fry stocking. Uh, where they, right after they come off the egg, there's a lot of fry stocking that's been done places, fingerling stocking, advanced fingerling stocking. Uh, you could, there's been some where you raise them to 10 inches in stocking. Uh, and the results vary so much upon what lake they go in, what forage, you know. There's, and there's really no rule. I'd, hate, I'd say it's one thing we've noticed is on these new lakes, these new clean lakes that have nothing but fathead minerals in there, we go in with walleye, fingerling. I think we're getting survival rates phenomenal. Uh, once you have a population of any predator, including walleye itself, you're, and then you stock the second or third year, it's it's less. But that first year stocking into a lake that has a lot of minerals in it, man, it's, it's unbelievable how many survive. Maybe pushing 50%, I don't know. It's not science, but a lot. We've had a lot of success with fingerling stock. We stocked those in Sakaka. We have had good success. Now, fry stocking, we call that paper fish. You, you can say you stocked 100 million walleye, but if they're fried, we've had very little success with fry stocking. Why is that? Define a fry versus a fingerling. The fry is, well, you know, it might be half an inch, three quarter inch long, still has the embryo sac. Right out, right out of the egg. Day or two after they hatch, they'll be stocked that size. What, why is it? Uh, we don't know. It's, there's something in the food. You know, there's some plankton that must be lacking when we put them in the lakes. I, I don't know. We've just had, haven't had a lot of luck with fry stock in over the years. With last year being such a, you know, a lot of ice, little snow, is there a lot of winter kill no. over the? No, we had. Good question. It was North, North Dakota fisheries are driven by winter kill. They really are. And we had a good winter. We had a dozen lakes, maybe, and half of them were the ones that winter kill every other year, anyways. Um, very good year. And this summer was probably the first summer in the last five that we basically had no summer kill. A couple of years ago, man, the pike were really hit bad by summer kill. The pike. We had a very good summer, too. So going into winter this year, our lakes are great shape. Water, water, everything. Water wise, uh, yeah. It should only get better in the next couple of years, but as soon as I say that, then something, something extreme happens in the state. So. Yes? You ever sell those finger links to private individuals? No, no, we don't. Uh, we, our, all ours come from the, from the two federal hatcheries. It's, it's, it's government. And, we only, I should mention too, somebody mentioned these new lakes, all these new lakes out there in the prairie. Uh, how do we go about getting going? Uh, 
by law, of course, no. we can't stock. It's a public sports we pay for. We can't sell it private. There are private hatcheries. Minnesota has a bunch of them. We only have two of them in North Dakota. But when we get a new lake going, the first thing we do is we need that depth of <coughs> water out there. Then we need access to it. And generally, not in all cases, but generally, what we need is a public access easement from the landowner. And the best thing that happens are these small wildlife clubs out in the prairie. They come to us. They are the farmers in that area. And that happens a lot, thankfully. And uh, there's, so there's buy-in with all the neighbors and everything right away. Uh, we'll go out and survey the lake. If it looks like it will go, we'll stock it, depending upon certain things. And lake wildlife issues, what we've seen now is we're going to have a lot of these, we've got to go back about three to four years later and start developing boat ramps. And that gets a little more touchy, though. Know? because there's a good walleye fishery out there. And what we found is some of the locals, they're okay for winter fishery, shore fishing, and if you can get your boat off the shore, okay, but they don't want to ramp because they don't want Bismarck and Fargo people coming here. It's, it's, it's worked really well, actually. Yes? Uh, so, I probably will never catch up, but that guy in the green hat's going to catch up for sure. Where does the state record walleye live in North Dakota? Have you had it in the bed or milked it or touched it or anything? Can you help me out In the day, back in the 80s, it, 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 it probably did exist. The, my boss back when I started said, he, yeah, there was a state record, Scott Guia, and is that a time that is real possible? Uh, the biggest fish I've ever seen in that was just short of 15. Uh, we've seen in the last few years, a lot of big walleye taken in a lot of lakes. Um, four of them over 14, I think. And, geez, a couple hundred in the last five years over 12. And the neat thing, where is it going to be? I, I mean, you could probably say Sakak, we have it. it. It's a lot. I mean, well, I'll tell you one thing Red River, uh, Hart Butte, Bowman Haley, maybe not Jamestown, maybe Ashtabula. Some of these mid sized residents of Tarley that have been around for a long time. There's not, there aren't many of them. Boy, there's some, there's, there are a couple very large pike and walleye those, those systems always. So if we get it, what do we do with it? If we want it to be the state record, what's the steps? Yeah, we just had an issue with the gold ice. Good, good question. First thing to do is get it to a, get it to a, a certified scale. And you know, all these Whopper play stations, you got to, Whopper stations, Whopper, uh, gas stations and stuff, be careful. We need it to be certified, the scale. If it's a, you're talking a walleye, bigger fish like that, and anything, go to a meat market. That's the best place to get it verified. Give us a call. we got to get a biologist down there to verify it. But, uh, and, and do it right away. Don't wait a couple days. How many stories have you hear about these guys catch a fish, and leave it in a bucket for three days, and then realize what they have, you know? Uh, and then we, Basically, that's it. Get a, uh, got to fill out a form. We have a new form now. But fill out the form, have a witness, get it on a certified scale, have a biologist look at it, uh, need a picture, and in some cases, like like Sakakui or something, we need a, a fin clip from it to do genetics because there's sagai, sagar, walleye issues and stuff. So if I'm illegally transferred, you have to drink your life. So throw, it, well, throw it on ice and it's going to take you 15 minutes to get somewhere usually. Well, unless it's a Sunday evening. The meat market's closed. But. And then, like I said, there's other skills out there. You can go to the Cenexes. They have their meat you know, The meat market is the best place, especially for a bigger fish. What's the person up camp list of these unnamed slews that potentially were stocked? Well, okay, here's, the, here's what we do. Uh, we stock the lake, and then when it's, the guys don't, it's up to the, we got six districts across the state, six district supervisors. It's their call when they decide to turn it on or off, a toggle switch, active or inactive. Once it, we're not going to tell you guys in this room to go to Lake X out here, and it's full of 10-inch walleye. But what, the next year, they're going to be 15-inch walleye, it's on. So it, it's their determination what species are in there, 
when they call it an active lake. Uh, so just and that and and we're trying to get to the point it's almost there that on, both on the web and the mobile app on your on your smartphone, you go in the li list of lakes. It's you can go in there and it's the day the guy turns it on, you'll see it. Uh, they do it continuously throughout the year, but especially in the spring and now again in the fall as you go into ice fishing. In the next month, they'll be going through the li list of lakes and uh, turning some more on. So is that guy just assigned its own? Uh, <laughs> that varies a lot. The name, the name of the lake varies a lot. We right. usually feel there's a name to it, and it's usually some local. It's a landowner sure. or something to do with locally, usually. The locals call it by such and such, so we call it such and such, such lake. So do you ever take names for lakes off the list? Yes, yes, we do. We'll go ahead and, winter kills, I mean, we'll take, you know, we don't want to send people to a lake where there's no fish. In the spring of the year, that's a big deal for us. So about three, four years ago, we had 52 lakes, and I think 40 of them were almost complete winter kills. And we're doing spawning fish and all this stuff, and we're open year-round, you know, now 365 days. So people are going out to these lakes and say, "God, you can't get anything to bite." Well, you all die. <laughs> so we got. That's where we need the public to let us know. You know seagulls are the best thing to tell you if there's a winter kill. Is the same true with perch? Or is it just like a walleye scale? What's that? So those perch lakes, like, has there been anything dedicated just to perch and no walleye in there? Mm -hmm. Is the same yeah. control in place for that? Yeah, yeah, what we do, per, perch management is, has a lot of, they perch have a lot of issues. The biggest is pike. Pike and cormorants. Those are, and then us, we probably number three. Yeah. A lot of predators on, on perch. Uh, so us, we all buy license, so that's a better thing. And then we need it. Uh, we'll get, and a perch, we found over the years what kills us is if we get into a new lake of new flooded vegetation, the spawning habitat, all that stuff is there. All we need to do is put in between one and 200 pounds of rabbit fish. It's critical that we get all right. Like this spring, we're breaking through the ice up left and right. It's a late spring. Perch spawn, they're kind of tied into the calendar a little bit too. So they're starting to spawn under the ice. And so we're getting moving fish day and night. There's such a small window to keep well, on them grab it. So when we put them in that lake, that it's not for you guys to catch those one or two hundred pounds of perch. It's their offspring that will produce that fishery down the road. And we've been very successful doing that. Uh, but you can't put them in, and the guys know this now. We can't put them into lakes that are full of fan. For whatever reason, it's a real established mineral population. Population's really strong. You, know, well, you just can't get them going. What we've done over time is we've gone, some lakes we've gone, we skipped the perch and went right to walleye. Walleye did quite well. Those so. uh, this is more of a comment than a question, but based on what I've seen with what you guys have done with those small lakes, with the perch and the walleyes, I think you, know, you guys have just hit home run after Mother Nature, Mother Nature has been great. The productivity of these wetlands is, makes it easier. But what the guys have done a nice job. I'll give you one lake. There's a classic textbook lake. It's a, it was started. It was a phenomenal perch fishery. They went in. The lake came up. The minnows were down. First time anything was stocked with perch, and they just took. And it was a great perch fishery. That was that first boom we had. Of, you know, around 2000. Did that nice boom. Really nice boom. Water started to dry up. Uh, I think we had a kill actually, knocked, the, knocked them back. The fat heads came up, the water came up. We stocked perch again, but this time there were fat heads in there. We had stocked two years, they went to take. What do we do now? So then we tried the walleye. We did the walleye. They took phenomenal, so it became a great walleye fishery. And then once the walleye cropped on the, the middles enough, we came back in with perch, and now we have both. It's, it's a balance, and it's, it's you know, there's so much, there's so, it's so dynamic, it's fun for the guys, but it's so dynamic and there's no recipe, each lake is different, but that lake is just, it was very good management by the guy that, the guy out of Riverdale has that one. Yes? Many of us here fish Devil's Lake on a regular basis. I can't tell you how many times I've been up there at the cleaning station and I 
see all these Iowegians come in with eights, nines, tens, and more, and you can test them about that, and you get a knife in your throat. Has there been any talks of a slot limit at Devil's Lake at all? On the wall line? Yeah. You talk about? No. Well, I shouldn't. Has there, there's been a lot of talk about it, yeah. There's been a lot of talk about different length restrictions. Um, there's certain, there's four criteria. You, if you have a one over, a slot limit, uh, a minimum, there's there's certain criteria that deals with recruitment, reproduction, exploitation. There's you know the things that come in to make it work, and that that is kind of recipe. Minnesota lives by it, and it works pretty well. Uh, Devil's Lake, like I said, is a good example right now. Is there may have been a year or two a slot limit would have had some. Or, or at least a minimum, a 14 inch minimum, might have done some good. It's not now. Like I said, it, there's so much out there. I know it really does bother a lot of the, especially the residents, when you see non-residents. But let's be honest, there's a lot of residents that take 12 inch perch walleye too, especially in the winter. Um, but a lot of these lakes, it's, it doesn't hurt it and it might be helping it. And that's a thing that's hard to believe. It gets back to Devil's Lake is that case right now. Where we have so many predators out there, and their forage is going to crash, and we're going to have nothing. Those those 12 inch walleye this year are going to be 12 inches next year, and the next year. That happens in Hawaii, like I said earlier. That's what happened in Hawaii right now. That's uh, that's that, again the predator prey balance is so critical in Devil's Lake right now. Where we could use we could use more gamuts actually more than anything. Which is the only way you're going to get that is if the lake went up and flooded even worse. What about furthering that discussion on the other end of the scale? Uh, invariably, when you visit with anglers from states that have spot limits and nothing over a certain length, right. uh, my observation is that anglers are getting better about putting big fish back. But the devil's lake discussion comes up all the time. But, you know, about Channel A, I'm going to haul all the slops out of there. Well, the trophy fishery, we don't manage for that for walleye. I mean, the Devil's Lake is a good example. We creeled last year with 5,000, 5,400 active fishermen and got their opinion whether they wanted a few big fish or, or more like a limit of smaller 14 inch. And the overwhelming response was a smaller fish. Um, it used to be on Devil's Lake, if you remember, it's Mave cool in the spring. They'd be taken out. And that's that's a hangover too. I know that L Linder days and the in fisherman days, I grew up with it in the seventies. North Dakota isn't the same as Minnesota. And I don't it, there's no it's not right or wrong. It's just different. The biology, the ecology, the water quality, it's all different. We're not limited by and large on, on eggs, walleye eggs. And that you, there probably were thousands of big walleye harvested up Mave Cooley. But you know, one, 2012 was one year, there was a lot of complaint for one of those years. And it was a record year class of walleye in the lake. It was unbelievable. That's those fish you're catching up. And it was a year that was just heavy, heavy harvest of brood fish. Below Bismarck, you hear that forever, yet it's a walleye factory. Why? We've never stocked it. Uh, 2012, spring of 2012, if any of you guys went to Hazleton in April, I mean, everybody was there, his bumper, bumper boat out there, and it was five fish. And, People have been starting to, this is just too good, this isn't right. Uh, they're catching too many fish, too big, too little, da 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 da. And we knew what happened in 2011. They're, the reason they're, they're biting like that, there was nothing to eat. And in the same fish, <coughs> 2012, 2013, into this year, we had a tagging study going on. The natural, natural mortality of those fish is off the charts. They're dying naturally, big time. Because there's nothing to eat. So it was a good thing that anglers were harvested, but you know, our ethics that we, we instill, which is a good thing, don't get me wrong, um, you know, the ethics of catch and release and all that stuff, it, it just rubs a lot of us the wrong way when we see five, six pound walleye at a fish cleaning station, or five, ten inch walleye at a fish cleaning station. In some cases, each lake's different, and, 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 and at a time, I mean, again, Three years later, three years before, and it's totally, your snapshot is totally different. So dynamic. And, and I, you know, Minnesota Lakes, sometimes I, I wish you, you could have that. No, I don't. But I, 
I mean, I don't want the people. There's so much pressure on a given acre of water, and the fertility isn't nearly as much. But, but at least it's more recipe, you know, in Minnesota, North Dakota. You're, you're so dynamic. Things change so fast. You can't stockpile fish. We've learned that, man. There's we got a whole bunch of lakes in South, especially South Central North Dakota, that are probably going to be phenomenal walleye fisheries. It's not very big, but and people are going to be so upset. They're just slaughtering them. Please do. The lake drops two feet. They're all going to die. You know, because it's so shallow. It's so marginal, anyways. Over the water hill. If you have any snow, we've gotten by the last couple of years because of the lack of it. You know, remember those three bad winters back to back to back. Those were tough. We had a couple of open ones. Huh? Yes. When we talk about you know waters that we fish at the club in North Dakota, probably closer to winter or summer, Jamestown Reservoir, Pipestone Reservoir, Ashtabula. Yeah. You know, those are heck of a good fisheries, but they seem like they really have banner years and then they really have sucky years. Like, is it just because the water goes up and down so much in the reservoirs? Like, you're talking about Scott and well, like, like Pipestone right now drilled 400 holes out there last year, found two crappies. The year before, I don't know. 150 crappies. What, what happened to that crappie population? Is that? Is well, that, that, that uh, crop, those crappie, we had that summer kill on the crappie out there. That probably said it's way. Worse than we even thought, but well, those are three good examples of tremendous water fluctuation annually, and that's that's a struggle, and it's really a struggle to get forage. So you don't get if you have stable water levels, you get vegetation, good veg, vegetation. Then you got stuff for fat heads of spawn, little shale things like Jamestown Reservoir. It's just tough to get forage established in there. Every few years, you get a good year class of something crappie that will feed the walleye. You know, walleye actually grow up a little bit, and then pretty soon that forage base, whatever it is, crashes. Walleye turn on. All oh, you guys are happy. God, oh, look at all the fish we get. But it's 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 so dynamic that way. It's so hard to deal with. Um, the other thing was, oh, James, Jamestown is probably one of those exceptions because Jamestown's right. The only thing that's helped Jamestown in the last ten years is all those other lakes around Jamestown that the locals. I mean, the fishing pressure on James, Jamestown's not a very big lake, and it still does, but it used to really get hit hard. And that was one lake that we really have, per acre basis, had probably, it's like a lot of Minnesota lakes, where it was being uh, fished down to a degree. Uh, it's probably been better the last 10 years. But. What about on the other spectrum, like these out-of-state people that are coming, you know, like the... Wisconsin people that had 400 fish. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't seem like the penalty is as harsh as it should be. Well, the penalties are, I know, uh, you know, it, this, you probably realize how this works. The game order writes you have to make, they make a double dip or an overbag or something. First off, getting those cases on their own is extremely difficult. You've got to babysit a couple anglers, you know, for a day or two. It's just, it's just intensive. The best way to make in cases are right here. We've said this forever. We're selling 220,000 licenses. That means there's 440,000 eyes out there. You know, and that wrap number is, use it. I mean, it gets so, we, the number of complaints versus the number of people that say officially, you know, give us the information, it's part of fishing, I think. It's fun to complain and to follow up on it. It's, please call that wrap if you see something happen. Um, but if a warden writes you up, or they get caught, okay, like that couple of high-profile Wisconsin cases, then it goes to the state's attorney, and they decide what to charge them. And then it goes to the judge. And, and, you know, right now, sometimes the judicial system, with all the other issues, especially in Western North Dakota, fishing over banks are not a big issue compared to everything else on the docket. So it's a low priority. You, you could get new law, there would be something with a law that strengthens your laws that have a higher penalty. What do you guys feel, one thing that's come up a lot lately, it's, do you remember the perch days at Devil's Lake, non-resident perch issue? And we used to be very liberal on the perch limit, like no limit. Then it was 250, then you know, 100, now we're down to 20, but our possession limit is four times a daily, 40, 20 and 80. And there's a lot of people that are saying that our possession limit, especially on perch, should be half of that or, or less. And it would limit 
the, the concern is a lot of perch are being gone and going to the meat markets and to the fish rise in Milwaukee and places like that. Um, you know, it's, they, they, they tell us that we got to make a case biological. It's hard sometimes when it's a social issue. Well, I know I've seen on Devil's Lake. I don't, I don't think I've ever been stopped, and I've seen old school in the morning and old school in the afternoon. You know, I can't legitimately say are they keeping a limit each time, but I bet you some of them are. Yeah. And well, that's the them, same thing the game I warden's see. dealing with. He sees a boat come, right. he sees them have some fish, and you know, and then he goes back up. He could even have you know, limit, and you still can go back and fish. You know. Right. Well, and you see the mungo along the road. And they're, they got their limit, and here comes, pulls up a car, and all of a sudden there goes the car, and yeah. they took all their fish and put it in the car, and the car is gone. Yeah. Or there's just so many of them, how do you keep track well, of them? Well, right, but... Got what? I don't know. This seems, this seems like it isn't strict, like they should be caught a couple times to kind of put a hammer down or some of that. But. Well, make it a high pro. Well, that, you know, that was a good case we had this summer. And, you know, to the defense of Wisconsin fishermen, man, I tell you what, you guys probably seen some of that. They were the the, the, the ethical uh, half in Wisconsin were very upset with what went down there. They had a Milwaukee, or Milwaukee TV station and the Madison newspaper opinion, their opinion page, and then phone calls we took, people apologizing for the acts of their fellow neighbors and stuff, they are very upset with the image Wisconsin fishermen were, were giving that they're not let all that way, and they're not. Yes? As a sportsman, is there something in the next five to ten years that we should keep our ear to the ground on? Do you see any potential political issues or something that we just need to be aware of and be thinking about? It's not a hot well, you never know. And it, usually they're smaller objects. Like it's back to that sport fishing group. Congress, very helpful, you know, politically if and when needed. Thankfully, with with good work, good, you know, grassroots work, you work, half of you guys, I wish were legislators that fished, and then you could, you know, you educate them, and then they, they understand the bigger picture, and, and there's no need to have a lot. Uh, the problem sometimes is you get one local constituent that says, we've got to do it this way, and he'll get the been the year of a legislator and then they introduced some legislation and then such a hassle and then to try to kill them. The biggest one would be water, the ownership of water. Um, you know, that's, that's, it's thankfully in North Dakota, it's, it's so unique, to, you know, it doesn't matter if you're Farmville, Bismarck, Grand Forks, Minot, or if you're Goodrich or Kindred or, you know, it doesn't matter where you're at. Uh, People generally like the fish, and it's culture, and people share the resource, and share the water, share the fish. So the public access to the waters that we have to deal with to get the public to a lot of these waters has been pretty darn good. But you know, sometimes you worry about somebody introducing some legislation. I'd, I'd see it as a lose-lose proposition if somebody wanted to say, hey, I, I own that water, some landowner saying that or something. I mean, it's going to be. It's, it's going to be half fields and McCoys, and it'd be really make an ugly deal for everybody, and no one would win. Well, that's my concern. I mean, I'm an hour and a half away from a lake, whether I go Minnesota, North Dakota, wherever. You know, when I want to go fishing, I don't want to be stepping on, you know, the land or toes, or you know, can I get on the right. lake? Yeah. You know, are people just throwing their boat off the road, getting on the lake? You know, and in some cases they are, and it is technically legal. In North Dakota, be careful, and, and, and on those cases, you know, always be courteous. And if you have any doubt, side with the landowner. I mean, I, there's one thing I I, I I feel for you know the flooding that's gone on. They've lost so much land. You know, in some cases, they maybe they got abatements or whatever. But there's paying taxes on land that's not productive anymore. And then three years later, there's a bull that used to be the used to be their garden. You know, in the back or their chicken coop. There's somebody out there in the boat, or they're ice fishing at six in the morning with an auger. You know, you got a feel for that. You know, as North Dakotans, I think we do. And generally in this state, it's been unbelievably good, considering what everybody's been through. Yes. Bruce, I like to say I, I eat you guys do a great job for you know, the price of a case of beer. 
three questions for you. One is uh, status on lake trout. I know you guys have tried to put lake trout in Sakakawea and it doesn't, doesn't uh, stick and all that. What's different from Sakakawea than Fort Peck? The other is, uh, uh, what can we do to get some more crappies? And a lot of times we're sitting around talking and a lot of guys say, you know, I'd love to go to Minnesota and fish crappies. How come we don't have more in North Dakota? Is it because maybe in some of these lakes are too shallow or, or what? Or so, is there one more? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can think on it. Okay. Uh, the Lake Trout, Fort Peck, yeah, it's, I mean, it's, well, Lake, Fort Peck is a good big fish lake. It doesn't have a lot of anything, but it has a lot of, other than big fish, you know, pike, walleye, doesn't matter, there's big fish in there. And it's, they don't have smell. It's, it's totally a Cisco forage base. And Cisco by themselves will grow larger, you know, we have Cisco in Sakakawea, but the smell all compete with Cisco. The only time the Cisco, made a bit of an impact is when during the drought when the cold water habitat was almost gone and snow numbers were at the lowest, the Cisco filled some of that. But that, that's the bottom line. We've we've tried trout, we've tried th two different times, three for three consecutive years stocking lake trout. I think three different sources. I mean we've spent a lot of time and money and it just it just can't get it to get it to hit. I just I don't think there's large enough cold water forage out there. Crappie is a great question, you know. But the, here's a problem with crappie, Minnesota too, but North Dakota actually, a lot of these lakes, if, if it, this crappie, if you know there's crappie in there at all, there's probably a lot. They do, the few that, that make it to adult size spawn, and they usually bring off a pretty darn good year class. One of two, two things happen with crappie. It's all when they're the first year, when they're young, this big. <coughs> One is, our water quality is a little, we got a lot more sulfates and stuff in our water. The growth in crappie young deer is not quite as good as Minnesota. It's good, but it's not quite as good. But that difference, and then our long winters, they have to have a lipid content to get them through the winter. We'll see a lot of lakes have crappie die-offs, young deer die-off. They just don't make it through that. That first winter is critical. Okay, so that's a, that's a bottleneck. And the other thing is, Crappie are phenomenal forage. Everybody, everything out there that eats fish loves crappie. Yeah, those young crappie, they are just, and we have so many predators, walleye and pike, especially in these lakes, that they just crop them down continuously. Audubon's a great example. It has got some, I mean, it has a lot of crappie every year, but there's just so many big predators out there that it's just food. So, it, it, those combination of those two things, we do, we, bluegills are more frustrating for the North State. We can't, you know, you pan fish and stuff like in Minnesota. We just, we just, you know, Tegan, Southwest North Dakota, we have some decent bluegill lakes, some Metagoshi here. But by and large, we, bluegill lakes are just a, a bugger. And we try, I mean, we trap and transport them too. But. Anything else? Yeah, Jeff. Yeah, I just wanted to ask you Every one of our speakers gets an FMLA hat. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, I think you're lucky that there was only 35 people here, because if it was a full crowd of 150, you'd be up here answering questions till about midnight. And they're all good questions, and a lot of them, I think, are just proof that these guys care about what's going on in the fisheries, and your responses show just how much you guys care, and how good of a job you guys do. And fish. Yeah. So thank you very much. Thanks for coming and for everything you do.